welcome to lesson one of creative programming for digital media and mobile apps. I'm Mick and uh, this is Matt and Marco and we're going to take you through uh, six individual lessons starting with uh, this week which is all about the basics of drawing and the basics of sound. So first of all we need to know how to manipulate graphics and draw them to the screen and we also need to know how images are represented on the screen. Marco's going to take you through that and he's also going to give you an introduction on how to use processing for making desktop, desktop applications. Matt's going to take you through how to control sound and how to find and playback sounds from the internet. He's also going to talk a little bit about manipulating sound and how sound is represented in the computer. In addition, he's going to show you a little bit about how to run applications that we develop on Android phones. And then I'm going to take you through the basis of using Apple devices. And after that, I'm going to show you how to make a basic app with simple interactions like mouse and touch interaction that plays back different sounds in different ways and also changes the way that certain types of images are drawn. So that's really what this lesson is about. It's kind of easing you in to the whole idea of making creative applications. And uh, if you've got any questions, you can check the forums. We'll be looking out for any of you who have particular issues. It's always a bit difficult getting started running software at the first time. So we've got a whole load of examples that you can download from the Coursera website. We're going to be referring to them throughout the next six weeks, starting this week. So make sure that before you ask questions, you have a look on the documentation that we've put on the website. There's a lot there. There are also people who are going to be on the forums expecting you to ask good, relevant questions. And hopefully, if you are stuck, then we'll be able to sort that out. So um, I think we're going to start off with Marco, who's going to do some graphics, and then move on to Matt, and then I'll be seeing you later on. Hi. We're the two guys looking bored in the backgrounds. I'm Marco. This is Matt. Matthew. Hi there. That was Mick, uh, our colleague. We're all three lecturers um, at Goldsmiths, uh, who in various forms have worked on the Creative Computing Program, quite a unique program, which uh, it's a computing technical programming program, so you're learning to code, but you're also learning to think and work with um, program code in a creative way, so cre producing creative outputs, uh, like sort of music apps or graphical interactive apps. And we'll show a little bit of that kind of work later. Um, and um, the three of us are lecturers. Matthew is now 100% bought out on a research, educational research project, which you might want to mention. Uh, yeah, just before we actually dive into the trenches uh, and look at some of the grenades that were thrown at us, um, uh, just to say that it's part of a sort of ongoing research interest at Goldsmiths uh, to look at um, mass online education and, and social pedagogies and so on. And uh, an example is this research project uh, called Praise, where we're developing a social learning platform for people learning to play musical instruments and learning about electronic music. And um, the platform looks like this. It's a three-year project. And we're partnering with um, Sony Labs in Paris, VUB in Brussels, um, uh, AAA in Barcelona. It's a big project. but it, it, So the, the MOOC kind of happened within this project to a certain extent in that I was working on the project. <coughs> and um, so it's really allowed us to feed a lot of uh, real-world experience into the de design of this project. But I just wanted to show you that to show that it's it's not a, it's all part of a general interest for us. Okay, thanks. Uh, we, da -da -da -da, everyone's having this trouble. Okay, uh, we did a MOOC um, on behalf of the University of London International Programs, um, which is actually the old, I think the oldest uh, distance learning university in the world, started in 1858. Um, fantastic, goes to a massive number of people throughout the world. Um, we run a program in creative computing on it, um, but it's extremely low tech. It's about really, it's about posting books and pieces of paper, you know, all around the world. It works, but you know, it's low tech. And this is part of a learning experience for them, publicity for them, and also for us was creating this MOOC. Um, so, um, so, about just over a year ago, in September 2012, we were approached by international programs and asked to do it. They said it was going to happen in June, 
Uh, and, you know, I'll say yes to anything that's an entire academic year away, so I said yes, <laughs> extremely foolishly. Um, and then kind of after that, we started, well, what have we actually signed up for? Well, what is a MOOC? What are we doing? Well, you get tens of thousands of students online for free, and they're assessed. How are we, you know, how, does it, how are we going to get that to work? And so this is part of the process, our explanation of the process we went through to come up with this um, ultimately, hopefully, successful MOOC. Uh, and it's quite nice, uh, after running this MOOC, uh, even today, I, somebody came up to me from the, from the audience saying, I did your MOOC, I really liked it. And you know, it's really nice to see that actually there's a lot of people out here who are doing this and are following this. So the next stage was quite a longish period of planning, uh, interspersed with all our normal activities, you know, face-to-face -face teaching and all that. Um, and, but it took a lot of thought to really think, you know, figure out exactly what we're, we're going to do. Um, and then we came in April to start off working on, it's a, it's a MOOC about writing software, and we started off by trying to figure out the kind of software they're going to write and produce a lot of examples. Um, and so this is, this is one of the examples we produced, as a sort of, uh, which shows that the combination of sort of graphically, aesthetically interesting um, presentation with, um, uh, you know, with sort of well, moderately complicated code. And the reason we had to put an enormous amount of work in this is when we're teaching to a group at, at Goldsmiths, you know, we can say, well, it's guaranteed to work on these lab machines. You know, and if it doesn't work on your laptop, you can at least work on the lab, lab machines. With a MOOC, people could be anywhere in the world on any sort of hardware, trying to develop devices on any kind of mobile phone. And we've got to make it work for at least some reasonable set of those. And we're working with an environment called Processing for writing software, which is fantastic. But it's 95% of the way of being completely cross-platform, working on a computer, Mac, Apple, Windows, Linux, websites, JavaScript, um, iOS, Android. It's 95% of the way there, but we needed that extra 5%. So there's actually an enormous amount of software development to go behind the scenes to actually make sure that the materials we're teaching could be accessed by everybody. Uh, next step is once we had those, we could prepare, plan our lectures. I mean, we had an overall plan many months earlier, but now we're getting slides together. And we moved on to um, a very manic three days in May where we had a professional uh, video production company coming in to film us. And maybe, Matthew, you can talk a little bit about this as one of your videos. Yeah, so we're going to kind of show you some of the good things in videos and some of the bad things. Now, uh, I think that Filming videos where you're trying to teach someone how yes. to write code is, is, uh, uh. Uh, has certain requirements. Uh, and for example, being able to read the code, right? Uh, so, uh, but of course, the people filming the videos were not programmers and they didn't really appreciate this. So for them, um, the, uh, they didn't realize they needed screenshots like this in the video. So the first videos that they published uh, had over the shoulder shots of just showing the, the video. Um, and we eventually managed to convince them to move to this one. I think we've got an example of the over-the-shoulder shot uh, in a minute. And you'll see that this is obviously really easy to read. You can see the code, um, and you can sort of pause it and copy it down. Uh, so, so we had certain sort of problems where, where the people making the films didn't necessarily know what was required of them. And, so, and because it was all very pushed and very sort of last minute, uh, there were fairly frantic editing sessions going on to get uh, screencasts embedded in videos and so on. So that was one of our first kind of really frightening <laughs> things because when we saw the numbers of people who were enrolled, we were thinking, uh, okay, 95,000 people have enrolled. Um, if I make a mistake in a video, um, right, so if, if, I, if I'm teaching 100 students and I make a mistake in a video, uh, you know, maybe one of them will get a bit annoyed and come and see me and I'll explain it, right? If I'm teaching 1,000 students, okay, that's 10 of them, and so on and so forth, 100,000 people, there's a good chance there's going to be someone who's pretty angry. Um, <laughs> so so w when these videos are published and you're, you're checking them, you think, oh, no, they've made that mistake again. It's, it's, really, uh, it's really quite, um, quite stressful. So, so we really had to work hard to make sure the videos had minimal errors in and uh, you know, to avoid that problem. 
Um, so, so yes. Yeah, so the next stage was, yeah, part of that was getting a review of it. So all our materials were reviewed by uh, University of London, and then we had a manic session trying to get the first two weeks up. Uh, I think it was two weeks ahead of, of schedule, with the video production company phoning us the day before saying we've edited it all. It's all fine. It's on a hard disk in Bloomsbury, and we're like. Uh, I'm in New Cross, and I'm teaching in the ne next hour. I can't get to Bloomsbury. How are you going to get it to me? Um, we eventually managed to get everything up. Um, oops. And then this happened. Uh, so we're working with... Uh, sorry. Then this happened. We're working with processing. It's a fantastic environment. The new version is released. It goes from 1.5 to 2.0. Fantastic. It's got loads of new features. That's brilliant. Um, it breaks a load of our code on our course that we've already recorded the videos for, and it's starting in two days. <laughs> so we already have stuff to start you know, bailing water off before we've even started, our, uh, started the, the um, the course, I already had to record an extra video to explain how to do stuff. Then the big red line starts, we begin, and then we have forum panic. Do you want to talk a bit about forum panic? Yeah, forum panic. So uh, sort of going back to this whole, um, you know, one in a hundred thing. Uh, yeah, so, Sorry. so they broke um, a whole bunch of our workflows um, with good intentions, of course. Uh, but um, so you can see here, it says 119. That means 119 people have upvoted that post. Um, so this was a key, key problem we had, was that the new version of processing, you couldn't make things work on Android devices uh, very easily. So, so there was a lot of work uh, clearing, that, clearing that up in the forums. And it, um, we, we were ready for this, though. We, were not, we weren't done. Uh, we, we basically hired students. Uh, we planned to have two students online, uh, nine to five, five days a week. Um, just answering questions in the forums because we knew and we'd heard horror stories of, of you know forums turning nasty uh, We really wanted to keep that squashed down um, So so, you know, we coped as best as we could obviously people new people would enroll They wouldn't bother searching the forums, so they'd keep posting the same thing again. Oh, it doesn't work. It doesn't work so, uh, But actually we found that the other people in the forums were actually very helpful So it was quite a positive thing as well as being a uh, quite stressful again, um, but certainly it was really good to see that peer learning really actually happening, and a lot of people saying, "Well, you know, it's not the guy's fault. They they just released a new processing version. There's a video about it." So we, were, you know, people were defending us. So that was good. Um, but one thing we found that some people just didn't want to be helped. They wanted to just cause trouble. They wanted to have, you know, an argument trolling. I think it's called right. Um, that was there was a lot of that going on. Uh, a reasonable amount anyway. Quite noisy trolling. And so, but then we discovered the spam button, uh, which was uh, a brilliant invention, um, which basically allows you to uh, make a post invisible um, to everybody except for the post person who wrote it. Uh, <laughs> pretty good. Uh, so uh, maybe I should keep that quiet. Uh, no, uh, too late. Uh, so yeah, so that was quite a useful uh, tool for if there, if people were posting and it really wasn't going to help anybody else, and they'd already been helped enough or whatever. And we just didn't feel that it was a constructive post. We, we decided we're, we're not a democracy. We want it to be a positive learning environment, so we're going to squash that kind of uh, behavior. So we did. Um, do you want to uh, Yeah, we've popped in another video. So here's, here's one of the things they complained about in the forums, the over-the-shoulder coding shot. And you can see why. Fair enough, I'd complain. Um, you can see that you can't read the code. But of course, the, the, the video production company were not coders, as I say. They didn't know this would be a problem. So they fixed it, that's fine. But it was not good fun because often it had to happen the night before that video was going live to all those people. So, yeah. And this is just an example of the forums. Lots of difficulties, problems, lots of answers, lots of, um, note here, this important one, staff replies. So that's our uh, teaching assistants getting in there. But also, as I said, lots of feedback from other students. And this is something we tried a lot actually internally with our own students and goldsmiths. Both Matthew and I developed a programming course which involved a lot of forum participation on behalf of students. OK, next up. Um, once, back there, once we, um, that got rolling, we started on assessments. And uh, 
this was, a, you know, slightly scary bit because there's, you know, 95,000 students. How do you assess them? Well, it has to be, there's two basic ways. Automatic assessment, which includes in-video quizzes and a weekly assessed, automatically assessed quiz. And then we have peer assessments where other students are assessing each other's work. So automatic assessments, mostly multiple choice, but you can also have standard text input. So it recognizes the correct text uh, and it can recognize sort of slight variations of that text. Uh, so we did that once a week. But we were trying to do not just simple programming exercises, but getting people to be creative. And you can, there's no way you can assess that with a multiple choice. So we also had peer assessments where they would do their own sort of open-ended exercise of their own creative ideas. Sorry. And then they would submit it, but then they have an evaluation phase where every student has to mark five other students' work. And only, they will only get a mark once they've mark other, marked other students' work. And once they've got that, those marks are aggregated, aggregated, averaged, and you get the student's final grade. What I would say is the first part is you know, pretty rigorous, but you're not really testing any sort of very high-level learning outcomes. The second part, we're going to investigate, but we've got a little bit of evidence that the, the marking isn't particularly reliable. So I'm not sure how reliably we can really test you know, very sort of complex learning outcomes in this kind of context. Um, so at this point, stuff started calming down. And the main reason is this, if you can see it. Uh, this is the end point, mid-July. And this is the number of active students, 38K. We said there were 95,000 enrolled. Only 38K were actually active. And that dropped right down to 6.6K by the end of the course. So exactly as Lindsay said this morning, people are dropping out. And Lindsay, you're not alone. Almost everybody is dropping out of the MOOC. And this is really not very atypical at all. 6.6K is still a massive number of students. Still massive more than I've ever taught uh, in the history of teaching in, um, uh, live. But you know, there's a big dropout rate. Um, after the end of the course, uh, we took a holiday, um, and then we uh, basically we sort of had to grade them all. They were all graded automatically, sent out certificates. We had some backwards and forwards with, you know, students as they do if they're physically present. Students, uh, I was ill. Sorry, I didn't realise the deadline was such and such. And I right, think so, so. You say okay. Um, I'll just tell those. Uh, well, in this case, six thousand six hundred people that um, someone was ill. So. Um, we're, we're going to extend the deadline. It's, it's quite challenging. So, so these sort of things that you can solve on the small scale by just talking to the people uh, don't really work on the large scale. And you, you hit, we, I think we hit all of those, all of those things which are different. Um, so this was a good example, uh, this, this, you know, the moving uh, deadlines. But we did actually move a deadline in the end uh, because there was just a, there was a reasonable number of people complaining it's about, on the, about it on the forums and they were upvoting. So in that case, we went a bit democratic and did uh, actually shift the deadline. And for all the, re the reasons Lindsay talked about this morning, it, you know, students are challenged. Uh, I find it challenging to meet deadlines on MOOCs. So you know, it is acceptable to, to extend them. We sort of after that, we got hold of some of the data. So we've got all the forum data, and Matthew is going to uh, do some analysis on on that uh, now. And at this point, we're moving on to sort of two things. We're going back and using some of that material in the classroom, blended learning. So we're using those videos, but also uh, to do our teaching, but also supporting that with physical labs. And we're going to start analyzing the data. So very high level data. We've got much more detailed data than this, but we've got some demographics. Average age. Uh, these are all the international programs ones. All of them have an average age over 30. Ours is actually the lowest, but still relatively high compared to undergraduates. Geographic distribution, uh, m large majority, com large amount coming to the US, but fairly wide distribution of developed and developing uh, countries. Um, and this, to me, is the interesting one. Highest qualification, their existing qualifications. The vast majority of them have got a degree a large chunk of them have got a postgraduate degree. So these aren't, um, this isn't about extending higher education to people who have no access to higher education. This is about continuing education for people who already have 
for exactly the people that Lindsay was talking about, highly motivated people who have already learnt their learning skills. So they already know and are highly proficient at learning. And it's very challenging in a distance environment to teach students who don't already have those learning skills in a way that we could support them much more easily if they're physically present and they can come to us and we can spend some time personalizing the experience to them. Um, so does that mean it's really not worth it at all and we've wasted a lot of time, Matthew? Well, what about the long tail? Uh, so um, the revolution of, of uh, music, which the MOOCs has been compared to, um, the, 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 the MP3 and the, the, the fact and the digitalization of, of music distribution allowed uh, more of those obscure artists to kind of get their audience, perhaps, the long tail. Maybe this is true. Uh, maybe, you know, yes, the, the big clump is all these ready educated people, but there is a long tail. And with those big numbers, there's a fair number of people in that long tail where they're not so uh, uh, proficient learners and they are making their way through the MOOCs. So I'm a bit more optimistic, maybe. OK, uh, this makes me optimistic. From no coding experience to game on the App Store in under tw 12 weeks. What a great course. Hats off to the people who developed the course. That's nice. There was other people who said it was the worst MOOC they've ever done. <laughs> but we pressed the spam button on that one. <laughs> uh, just going to show some very short videos of some of the work some of the students on the MOOC did. This is a nice little game. We couldn't work out how to play it. Yeah, we couldn't work out how to play it, but it looks nice. Uh, a kind of music and visual sort of niceness thing. Uh, this is quite cool. You can't hear the music. Just yeah, because um, we're talking over it. But uh, this produces some really nice visual effects. And uh, not the best visuals in the world, but a fully working physics-based um, snooker game. So three examples. And so that was our MOOC. Thank you very much.